I just came across a repository with 33 JS concepts you have to know, but do I even know them? What's up everyone and welcome to the channel. My name is James Hugh Quick and I do weekly videos about web development related topics. I talk a lot about JavaScript and specifically vanilla JavaScript and making sure that you understand how JavaScript works. I'm actually a really big fan of learning JavaScript before vanilla JavaScript, but before moving on to frameworks like React, Angular, Vue, Svelte, that sort of stuff. Because I think that core knowledge in, um, in your JavaScript will help you learn other things. After you learn core vanilla JavaScript, you can learn any other framework that you want to. So I'm gonna walk through this list really quickly and just kind of almost blind react uh, to these topics that you must know as a JavaScript developer and give you an honest idea of whether or not I actually understand these things or know the words that are in there. So I'm kind of curious to see how this plays out. So let's go ahead and dive into the list. All right, uh, so I'll have a link to this repository uh, in the description below so you can go and check it out. You can kind of follow along if you want to. And we'll just kind of uh, run through this. I can uh, zoom in here to make this a little bit bigger. But uh, number one is the call stack. So call stack is something that I uh, understand. If people are familiar with stacks and queues, a queue uh, is what we in America call a line. Uh, in England, for example, they call it a queue, but it's uh, first come, first serve. So if you're in the first uh, first person in the line, you get served first if you're looking to check out. Uh, stack is actually the opposite. Uh, so instead of first in, first out, it's last in, first out. So you stack, you're stacking things on top of each other, and then you take off of the stack, you pop off the stack. Uh, so this is how functions are called. So you call a function and then it calls a function. So you add it on top, you finish this one and then you pop it off and then you do the next one uh, sort of thing. So that's what the call stack would be. Your primitive types is number two. Uh, I believe this would be like number and string. I don't, uh, mainly number and string in JavaScript, for example. The opposite of primitive types would be objects in JavaScript, which includes arrays because they're really just objects underneath the hood. Uh, this is actually really important uh, coming down to number three with value types and reference types. So I, you'll probably hear this referred to as pass by value, pass by reference. Uh, so the idea is if I'm going to uh, pass a variable to a function, if it's just a primitive type like a string or a number, it's passing the value directly. Um, and then that function will have its own value. So if it alters that function, if it changes the string property to be James is cool from the original value of James is lame. That's not going to affect the original one versus if I have a JavaScript object and I pass that to a function, it's actually passing a reference to that function, which means if you change a value of that object property or a property of the object, it's going to change the original one because they're both pointing to the same uh, space and memory where that data is held. This is really, really important in JavaScript. This is something I 100% agree. Uh, this is really important to know. I'm kind of interested in this one, uh, implicit, explicit, nominal structuring and duck typing. I have no, like I probably, I probably understand the stuff that's behind the scenes, but I have no idea uh, what this is. So implicit, explicit, nominal structuring. I have no idea what duck typing is. It looks like some of the implicit and explicit, um, maybe about coercion. So when you do some, um, when you do some equality tests, if you look at double equals versus triple equals, Double equals is comparing a value and not necessarily looking that two things are the same data type. So the string one is actually double equals to the number one, but triple equals uh, will not be equal because it's gonna look at uh, the value and they kind of look similar, but the data type is different, a number versus a string. So without even really going into this uh, much more, I think this is talking a lot about uh, coercion. So I would say probably the majority of this I understand, uh, but I actually have no idea what duck typing is. Let's go in. Uh, do a duck typing JavaScript because I have n I've, I don't think I've ever even heard of that. So I'm kind of curious what this is. What is duck typing? Let's see. Duck typing means that if two or more unrelated objects respond to the same method name, they are ducks, even if they aren't. JavaScript concern, JavaScript thinks they are all ducks and we get the desired output. They might as well be ducks. So with regard to the picture, as far as JavaScript concern, each if an object has a response to a type method, it's a duck. I I don't get it, to be honest. I, I would have to look into that more. But I think that's kind of cool to show that, like, this is a term I've never uh, never even heard of, and I would percent consider myself pretty good at JavaScript. Um, so anyway, uh, then we talk about function scope, block scope, and lexical scope. Uh, this is fun. I honestly 
the block scope and lexical scope, I forget how those are different, uh, but function scope is like you have access to the variables inside of a function that you define inside of a function, as well as anything in the parent scope. The uh, block scope would be kind of a similar thing, but you have access to uh, a variable that you define inside of an if loop with that block inside of itself. Uh, I forget what lexical scope is. I think this is probably getting into the difference between uh, constant let versus uh, versus the var definition for variable. So let's look up uh, lexical scope JavaScript. Let's look at what that is. Well, it is lexical scope. A variable uh, defined outside of a function can be accessible inside another function defined after the variable declaration. Um, okay, oh, well that makes sense, yeah. So I actually, uh, we'll talk about closures here in a second, but I'll, um, I did a video on JavaScript closures that you should go and check out. So yeah, this is kind of just, I think, because it's coming from the broader parent scope that it would then be available inside of uh, that scope. So uh, anyway, yeah, cool. So then uh, we talked about this already. Number five is double equals versus triple equals. Again, double equals will compare the value and the data type versus triple equals will compare, did I say that wrong? Double equals work and will compare the value and not the data type. I don't know if I said that right the first time. And uh, triple equals will compare the data value and the data type. That's the difference there. Oh, and it looks like I had skipped. I had skipped that before, so I already jumped down to number six. Um, number seven, this is kind of interesting. Like, I feel like this is not a complicated thing at all, but I have no idea what uh, an expression versus a statement is in JavaScript. I don't know how that is defined. Uh, so let's see, all you need to know about JavaScript expressions and expression statements. Let's see. There are two major syntax categories, statements and expressions. So expressions are JavaScript snippets that result in a single value. So all these things uh, would return some sort of specific value. Okay. Oh, interesting. So uh, these statements are like defining your if and if else and while and those kind of things. So kind of like the keywords in there uh, or just things that don't actually return to you a value. I never would have needed to differentiate that, but that's kind of cool. Uh, number eight on here is ifies, uh, which stands for immediately invoked function expressions, uh, which are kind of odd. It's a way that uh, before uh, classes and kind of different bundling packages for scopes were in place, ifies were kind of the default way to kind of wrap your, create a wrapper around the scope of the thing that you're trying to create. So the, the most common use case here is if I created a JavaScript uh, SDK, if you're just packaging a bunch of JavaScript that goes on the global namespace, then I may have naming clashes with other variable names that the user is using. So within my, uh, my SDK, I have an alert message variable and it's on the global scope. Then if the user creates their own alert message variable, now they're going to conflict. So uh, with ifies, you kind of wrap all of your functionality in this function that you immediately call and that kind of returns to you basically that scope thingy. And then you can use it and um, and people use that for namespaces to basically keep their keep scope around the stuff that's specifically for an SDK or a library or whatever it is. So number nine, uh, message queue and event loop. This is uh, this is really cool. I, like I kind of would debate about this being an essential thing for JavaScript developers to understand. I think it's super useful, but this actually gets pretty deep. Uh, so there's actually I'll tie in number one with number nine. There's the call stack, then there's the message queue and the event loop. And the uh, the message queue would be saying uh, this thing that's kind of saying like, hey. I'm ready to, to have something uh, done with me um, or I, I've finished my results, you can come and get me. The event loop is then checking for those messages and then uh, acting on those messages if there's anything to act on. So it's how JavaScript works behind the scenes. It's pretty complicated. I'm not the best person to give like a detailed definition of how all this stuff works. There's some great videos on YouTube that you can go and check out. It's really interesting uh, and it's really cool to learn how it works and it really helps understand how asynchronous JavaScript works, which is core to the language. Uh, JavaScript engines, I don't, it's funny, like just definitions. What do we, what do we define as a JavaScript engine? Let's see. Oh, uh, the JavaScript, like V8 in this case. So the engine is gonna be the thing that actually uh, runs the JavaScript. It's going to have like the translation layer to the, um, like your browser runs uh, on an engine. It's gonna have the translation layer from JavaScript to uh, the actual computer itself. And I think we'll do some sort of translation between JavaScript and then uh, either like bytecode or C, C like tran translating to C to bytecode. I'm not exactly sure 
uh, for the most part, like it's it's what m makes your thing able to run. Um, JavaScript engine is what allows us to have Node, which allows us to run uh, JavaScript on a server as well. So it's taking uh, similar to how you have the engine inside of the browser to run JavaScript, you could have your engine uh, just running on a server without the browser to be able to run your JavaScript there. <sighs> Bitwise operators type arrays and array buffers. Um, I think the bitwise operators I've never actually used. Um, let's see, I'm gonna see this article really quickly. Because these are gonna be Yeah, it's kind of so I've never well, I've I, I don't know what the difference is between like the logical operators and the bitwise operators. Bitwise operators, again, I've never specifically used except for in class. Um, so I, I've, I've done XORs and NORs and all that stuff. Um, and then they're shifting operators with shift bits. I've never really used this myself, except for one example, I think, when I was doing some color conversion from like hex to something else or something, I can't remember. Anyway, I would say this is stuff that like I don't use very often. Number 13, DOM and layout trees. Uh, working with the DOM, I think is core to JavaScript. Um, understanding how to work how to work with the DOM and vanilla JavaScript then makes you that much better at understanding how frameworks work later on. So uh, this is obviously super, super core to, uh, to JavaScript. Factories and classes, it's kind of interesting. There's like no order to like depth of JavaScript with these, but 13 is, uh, or 14 is factories and classes. So classes, uh, the class syntax is now kind of a first class citizen as of, it's been a while now, but ES6 um, JavaScript. So that gave us this like syntactical sugar to define classes where we didn't have to do uh, like the function constructor things that we used to have to do. Now we have like a pure class definition where you can define instance variables and, and functions inside of it and that's that sort of stuff and a constructor as well. Uh, factories is basically a pattern to be able to create objects. So if you like have an object that, um, I don't know, you created and it has some sort of complicated logic that it, ha it has to go through to actually create it, instead of doing that individual, uh, doing that every single time manually, you create a factory that can go and generate those objects for you is basically what that comes down to. Uh, this call apply and bind for number 15. Uh, this is going to be like the current scope. So in uh, just the beginning of a JavaScript file, you'll be in kind of the global uh, scope there. And then it changes uh, based on what function you're in. Um, and there's differences between like uh, arrow functions and regular function definitions and stuff like that is the scope that you're looking at. If you want to change the scope of the thing you're working with, you can use call, apply, and bind. And this is actually interesting because I have never once used call, apply, and bind. I kind of know in theory what they're used for and they're like very small differences between them. Uh, but I couldn't tell you individually what they do now, and it's not something that I ever, ever use. So 16 is uh, the new keyword constructor instance of and instances. So going back to classes, you would have instances of uh, that class, uh, you'd have an instance of the class definition, which would be an actual object that you work, work with, you can use the instance of property to check uh, if something is an instance of a certain class. Oftentimes you see it, um, and then you can have the new operator is called to create a new instance of an object uh, of a class definition. And then the constructor is the function that gets called when you actually create that uh, object. So if there's any initialization that needs to be done where you set class uh, properties based on inputs to the constructor, you would do that there. So 17, uh, again, a lot of overlap here, prototype inheritance and prototype chain. Uh, this is basically like I think about kind of your typical inheritance stuff in programming, although there's some quirks in JavaScript. And I will say at this point, I I don't like, I, I don't have anything to do with the prototype, like nothing about specifically prototype do I work with or worry about. I use classes, I can use inheritance, and I know what inheritance is. Uh, but I like I, I don't know, like I don't I don't actually work with the prototype or change the prototype or or anything like that. It just it's kind of basic inheritance to me. So I, I don't have I think it was more important before I'd understand uh, prototype inheritance in JavaScript before you got the class syntax, which has been several years now. Uh, object I create and object that assign. I'm actually not aware. I don't know what this is right offhand, although I'm assuming it's not that difficult. Let's uh, let's just look at MDN documentation here for object dot create. It's a new object using existing object as the prototype. 
Okay, so if I have this object here, and then I call object.create person. Okay, so this will create an object based on that person property. Say me. So what what is the difference? Why why would we want to do that? Name is a property set on me, but not on person. So I guess this makes creates a new object using existing as a prototype. I'm not exactly sure what difference that makes. Object create w w3 schools. I like their definitions better, honestly, because I feel like um, I feel like they are simpler and more to the point, and usually get me like just what I need to know. I don't know if that's going to be. Let's see, object dot create different ways to create new objects. It's not going to tell me specific differences, which sucks. Uh, so objects, do I have any different examples in here? A new object with a specified prototype object and properties. I'm not actually sure. Um, this may make a, surely this doesn't make a deep clone of the object. Um, although it seems to, because usually what would happen if you create an object and then you assign a new variable to that same object, if you change the properties on the new thing, it would um, it would change the original one. But this is saying that it's not set on a uh, person. So anyway, something for me to learn, I guess. Maybe, I don't know, let me know what your use cases are for object create and assign. 19 is map reduce filter. I've got videos on these uh, learn in five minutes type things. These are like hands down, probably one of the most useful things that you can learn uh, in JavaScript is the array functions. And this is just super easy way uh, with a concise syntax to manipulate your array data. So highly, highly recommend uh, learning about those array functions. 20 is is uh, really nice too. So pure functions is a fun or a function is pure if you get the same input or same the same input gives you the same output and there's no side effects, which is the next piece here. So if I have a function, what I don't want to do is like go out and grab a variable outside of the scope of of that function. Uh, and I don't want to change a value outside of the scope of my function. And because of that, or the reason for that is so that every time I call that function, if I pass the same input, I know I'll get the same uh, output. So pure functions won't have side effects. Uh, state mutation, I don't know exactly, like I would think about that in a React context. So I'm updating the state that I'm keeping track of in my React components. I don't know if this is something more specific. And then event propagation, uh, if you click on a button, uh, we'll actually kind of uh, propagate uh, the event click all the way up the DOM tree. Uh, so if I'm only listening for that event on the button, then I don't have any issues. But if you want to, um, I don't know, click on one thing and then handle that event handler above or something, I don't even know, really. Um, I don't use event propagation uh, that much. Like I've done it in some tutorials and stuff, but it's been a while. But basically that stuff uh, will bubble up for you. All right, next up is 21 uh, as closures and closures I actually just recently did a video that you can go and check out for closures in five minutes. But basically if you define a function inside of a broader scope and you defined a variable in the parent scope, whatever that is, it could be another function, could just be the global scope or whatever. If the inner function that you define references that variable um, inside of its code, it will then have access to it even if it's not invoked immediately. So whenever that function is called, it's kind of set, set aside and defined, and it has uh, that variable or those variables inside of its scope that you will be able to uh, reference later on. So that's what uh, closures is. Uh, higher order functions is basically a function that will return a function. So if you want to customize the way a function acts based on some sort of parameter, you could define a higher order function, pass it a parameter, do some logic, and then return a function that now does something differently based on that parameter. So it's basically like, say, hey, you, Based on this data, I want you to give me a function that I can call later Later, that will now do something specific based on the data that I gave you. Recursion is calling the same function over and over again. This is not specific to JavaScript at all, uh, but uh, it's useful. You'll see it in like the, what's the counting? The one, three, five, eight, what is that called? Gosh, count one, three, five, eight. It'll be in here somewhere. Uh, Fibonacci numbers. I feel like I should know that offhand, but uh, you see it in those kind of things. Honestly, recursion is something that I use a lot in school, but not as, I don't know if I've really defined a recursive function in code professionally, to be honest. Uh, but it's something I know about and know how to do. Collections and generators, I have no idea. I've, I kind of looked into generators when they were new, I think in ES6, and I had no idea what they were doing, and I have no idea now. And 
I've never used them and I don't really care. So if you love collections and generators, let me know uh, what you use them for in the comments below. Uh, promises, this is like core to JavaScript and I'll throw in async await as part of this as well. But uh, promises is how we do this async nature in JavaScript where you call a function and it says, hey, I'll give you a, I'll give you a value back at some time. I'll either give you a value or tell you that something went wrong. So the way you do that with promises is you have a dot then and a dot catch. You'll have your data in your dot then or you'll have an error in the dot catch. And then with ES8, I believe, async await syntax came, which I love. And it allows you to kind of write asynchronous code that looks synchronous. So it'll kind of stop and wait, await for a response to come back before you then continue your code. And then you handle errors with a uh, try catch. Data structures at 27, uh, this is something that I think gets overlooked a lot. I think there's two sides of this. I think it gets overhyped a lot and then it gets overlooked a lot. And the fact is, if you wanna go to some of the top tier tech companies, your data structures and algorithms, which is 29, your knowledge of that is gonna to have to be really good. So if you want to work at one of those top tech companies, even if you disagree that it's the best way to judge a candidate, it's something you'll have to learn. And it's something that gets overlooked a lot in boot camps specifically. So I had a lot of time with data structures and algorithms in college. Uh, this is over the course of four years. So these are two topics that I recommend people look into and combine and just make yourself more marketable in terms of your interview potential, regardless of whether or not you think that it's the best way to gauge someone's talent. Expressive operation and big O notation. Uh, big O notation is going back to the data structures and algorithms. It's basically a way to define how uh, performance an algorithm is or not performance. So relative to another one, how do you define and compare in that sense? Uh, inheritance and polymorphism. Inheritance is having a parent class uh, with, or having a child class of a parent and then inheriting the properties and functions of the parents inside of the child. So if you have an animal class uh, that has a name property and then, oh, actually let's just start with a name property. Um, then you could have a child class like lion. It will inherit that name property and it could also define its own like species. I don't know, species, uh, property or like, I, I don't know what it, feline species or something, something else additional that's more specific to lions, but not all animals would have maybe main length or main color, but then the women lion don't ha I don't know you could figure that out but inheritance is inheriting those properties from the parent class polymorphism is is treating an instance of an object as if it was another one which could be really powerful this is kind of a different uh deeper topic on uh, object oriented programming I do encourage people to go and really learn about object oriented programming one for interviews and also for overall knowledge uh code reuse here is Important to just write as little code as you can, not super complicated, uh, just kind of a high level topic. Same thing with design patterns at 31. Um, design patterns, there are a lot. Factory is a design pattern. Singleton is a design pattern. That's about all that I can name right off the top of my head. Not that I couldn't recognize them and implement them off um, when I need them. It's just not something that I like study and know like words verbatim off the top of my head. Uh, partial applications, currying, compose, and pipe. I, I don't know what any of that is. And I always forget uh, JavaScript currying. I always forget what currying is, although I have uh, studied this like in different tutorials and stuff. I forget what it is. So let's see. So currying, uh, this is actually, I am had to pause here and kind of look up some definitions here because it is similar to higher order functions. In this example, like it's kind of hard to make this make sense um, in these examples, but They've got this multiply function, which is not written out very well. This is a very shorthand syntax for arrow functions, but it's basically saying multiply is a function that takes one parameter X and then returns a per, uh, function that takes parameter Y and then multiplies those together, which means I can call multiply with a value of three. It then returns back to me a function that takes a parameter of Y and multiplies that times X, which in this case is three. Uh, so then you can call triple as your function. So it's basically, uh, passing some sort of property along to then get a function uh, back versus higher order functions are specifically passing functions to a function, uh, which I, I, I would assume they, at least most of the time, return the actual, or returns a new function. You pass a function to then return a new function. In this case, uh, we're passing a value to get back a function that we can then call. So kind of, I don't know, small differences there. I don't know how I end up using that myself, but. Uh, let's see, the last part of this is just clean code. So this is again, uh, an idea of like, I shouldn't 
I shouldn't repeat code. I should reuse code and I should take advantage of all the things that we talked about in this list. So anyway, uh, I thought this was kind of fun. Um, you can tell I'm not the most like by the book definition type developer. It's just not where I am in my career. I know how to uh, write code and some of the language that I use is different than some of the stuff that's probably the correct language. And that's okay because if it comes down to an actual conversation, uh, then I'll be more specific. Uh, but I feel like I can write pretty good JavaScript uh, most of the time. So anyway, let me know what you thought of the list. Are you surprised of the ones that I did know or most importantly, probably didn't know? Um, Cause I wanted to be honest with you and let you know kind of where I am with this list. So let me know the things that stuck out to you. What makes sense to you? What did you not think belonged on the list? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks as always for checking out the video and I'll catch you in the next one.